On today's show, we'll take a look at where the Maple Leafs sit at American Thanksgiving and poke a little bit around the Atlantic Division to see where they stack up amongst their division rivals. We'll get into all of that and more on today's edition of the Lockdown Leafs Podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked On Leafs podcast, a daily Maple Leafs Center podcast hosted by myself, Mike DiStefano, and my co-host, Dave Morissuti. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NHL for $20 off your first purchase. What's up, Dave? It's uh, it's going to be a bit of a longer week again. It's such a weird schedule that the Maple Leafs have had. We'll get like no games, basically in the matter of three weeks because of the Swedish schedule. Like, they played, you know, uh, what was it? The the last weekend they played the back-to-back and then didn't play again from Sunday until the Friday. Played a quick Friday, Sunday, and now they don't play again until this Friday. So just legitimately within, like, a 12-game – or within, like, 12 days or so, legitimately get, like, two Leaf games in between that time. It's, it's so bizarre. You know who's hurting the most from all this? The bars, sports bars, that want to show a game at night, and people are just like, all right, let's go watch the Leaf game tonight. Uh, There's no Leaf game tonight. Oh, they're back on Friday. Uh, Yeah, but they're playing in the early afternoon. Like, it it must be frustrating, because that's where bars get a lot of their, uh, their, especially sports bars. There's a place in my area, although it was bumping when the Leafs weren't playing, so not suffering all too much, but I know that they would prefer to have some hockey at night. Yeah, I mean, they, they clearly would. There's there's a lot of stuff going on. You've got the Raptors back in action, obviously. Toronto, they're doing all right. They're doing all right. What do you make of the uh, that in-season tournament stuff that's happening, though? Like, do you think – are you buying that at all? Do you think it's something worthwhile? Like, should the NHL maybe think about doing something no. like this? Like, no. NHL can't pull that off. The NHL can't even get international hockey done properly. It's, so. it's not even – like I don't even know what it is because like all these games they count toward the regular season, but then also they double count in within like group stage. Like it's not like it takes crazy planning to do. I mean, they're trying sure, to do like what soccer does, right? They're trying to do tournaments within the season. The tournament within the season. Um, yeah, like I had a friend of mine who doesn't really follow the NBA ask me a million questions about it which made me realize the NBA has done a really terrible job of really explaining what exactly the only way, you know, it's an East season tournament game is those weird court designs and the jerseys. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise you have no clue that this game, like, Oh yeah, this game counts towards the regular season, but it also counts towards this other tournament that we're trying to get players to actually care about the regular season. Yeah. I, I I don't know. I, I don't quite understand it, but I mean, it, maybe we'll see if it works. And, and if it does, I would be curious to see if the NHL thinks about it. Like, do you think this would be, I, I don't know. Like, I, I think that if it works for the NBA, if they find out that it does drum up some interest here and the players enjoy it or whatever, perhaps it's something that could leak into, you know, North American sports because, no, there are lulls within the regular season. Maybe it's a little too early doing it at literally like a month into the season, yeah. but potentially doing this like midway through the year during the, the winter blues, as they say, um, in the middle of like January, February, perhaps that is, is a time to do it to try and, you know, spark something different. Um, try and give people something to play for in the middle of the season when, when you get that lull. But yeah, it's, it's been a bizarre, uh, bizarre thing to watch it was a little bit of a tangent went completely off topic there but i just thought maybe you know i will say this if they want to potentially do this instead of the all-star game Mm -hmm. and then i could look at like if you did like a three on three tournament sort of thing that's something that maybe yeah but here's the thing though like you can't how is that any different from the all-star game and the all-star game is one weekend right like this yeah. The, the the what they're doing here, like these games, count towards the regular season and yeah. the group stage in this tournament. So it's you can't have 
just random three on three games thrown into an NHL schedule. You know what I mean? Probably not my best suggestion. I I would say something that bring like players can actually get into and will actually be want to like the reason why they're I, I said as the reason why the NBA is doing this because players there are certain players who don't care too much about the regular season. They're like, ah, eh, yeah, I can take the night off even though I'm making forty plus million dollars to play. Well, they're gonna get paid. Like whoever wins, I mean, this yeah, there's extra cash on the line too, which. Like Cash, Cashola, and I believe the championship game will be held in Vegas. So you get basically like a night in Vegas with the with your team if you guys win, and you can go all out. You know what I mean? So I don't know. It's interesting. I don't think that the NHL would follow suit here. Like I know we sometimes we see you know sports in North America become copycat leagues with you know all the wild cards that we've seen added and throughout all of these sports now, and and you know playoff expansion, team expansion, but. This one, I'm not sure it's going to work out, uh, and and we're going to see many many clubs uh, or many sports do this. Um, but hey, kudos to the NBA for thinking outside the box, I guess, and trying something. If it doesn't work, now nah, you scrap it. Ultimately, it doesn't mean anything, and there's just a couple extra games, uh, like a bye week essentially, is what they're getting once this tournament kind of finishes up and and they do the final. Okay, these are the group teams who won the groups and. Away they go, a little little tournament at the end of uh, at the end of the at the end of the I guess December though it's not even like it's at the end of the year. But anyway, uh, this isn't locked on Raptors or locked on NBA. It's locked on Leafs. And uh, what, what we kind of want to do today, and and again, this conversation started with us talking about how there's not much going on with Toronto because they were away in Sweden, and I've only played two games within a, a 12 day span basically so there's not a lot to talk about that's how we end up on that raptors chat but um american thanksgiving is typically the time where teams can take a step back and evaluate okay what are we you know you finally start to see you know who teams are and and some separation within the standings we thought now's a great time to do that the leaves kind of off this week and, and they won't play another game before american thanksgiving it's a good chance to reflect on you know the 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 leafs how they've been, the players. We can maybe give a, a quarter season MVP. Who do we think has been most disappointing? Who needs to step their game up? We'll just kind of do an overview of where the Leafs are at at the American Thanksgiving mark. So why don't we uh, why don't we take a break? We'll come back and then we'll we'll really sink our teeth into the Maple Leafs and, and the start that they've been on. And uh, and if we got some time, we'll we'll look around the rest of the division as well and uh, see where teams are at. Uh, around the Atlantics. We'll do all that when we return. But first, I do want to tell you guys about one of today's show sponsors, and it's our good friends over at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast. It's Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti, your hosts here at Locked On Leafs. We're a daily Maple Leafs centric podcast. We got new episodes coming out each weekday, Monday through Friday. So if you are a Leaf fan uh, and you're 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 brand new, you're just stumbling upon us, uh, give us a shot. Go ahead, subscribe, listen daily. Because uh, if you do consider yourself a big part of Leafs nature, you're going to want to be locked into what's going on with Locked On Leafs. Um, you can find us wherever you get your podcast, also up on YouTube. All right, Dave, let's sink our teeth into how the Leafs have done so far through the year. It's been a little bit of an up and down start to the to the season for Toronto, I guess you could say, but currently riding a nice little four game winning streak coming out of Sweden. So things are, I guess, on the up and up now. Uh, the team's currently 10, 5, and 2 with 22 points sitting third in the Atlantic division. Um, you know, how do you, how do you feel like this team is playing 
right now? Are you happy with how things are turning out for Toronto, or is there still, you know, some some? Is this a team that has a lot of work to do still to get to where they want to be? Well, I'm glad the offense isn't a tire fire like it was up, you know, at stretches uh, at the start of this. Defensively, I'm still that's still the one thing I'm I'm concerned about, right? I don't think it's as bad, right, as we saw during that losing streak where they couldn't keep the puck out of their net when they're at home. But I also think, you know, they're lacking that that toughness in their own end, right? The ability to make life easier for the goaltenders. I don't think they've done a good job of that this year. So the good thing is they got a positive goal differential. Mm-hmm. It's not, I mean, it's plus three, which is not, I mean, it's, it's positive, but it's not going to be good enough in my opinion, right? If you want to be a really good team, that goal differential has to be in the double digits at some yeah. point. Yeah. And, and I suspect it will. Um, again, still pretty early on in the season, but I, I do expect for it to to start to creep up. I mean, we're, we're talking about a team who's got 62 goals through 17 games, just doing a quick look at the standings board. I believe that's uh, number two. Uh, it's technically number two in the standings. Tampa has 68 goals so far, but they have 19 games played. So two extra games, um, and they've been able to get six extra goals in those games. So you know, by goals per game, perhaps Toronto's in a bit of a better situation. But still, you know, one of the top teams when it comes to goal scoring in the East. Um, my question to you, Dave, is you talk about goal differential. Well, the, the team with the best goal differential in the Eastern Conference is the Boston Bruins, who sit atop of the Atlantic Division. Do you think the Maple Leafs still have a chance to win the Atlantic? Like, did, did Boston's start... And Toronto kind of faltering a little bit early on cost them a chance to win this division? Or do you think there's still time for Toronto to catch up and, and, you know, become Atlantic uh, champs, much like we predicted earlier before the season started? The only reason why I'm not giving the Bruins the crown just yet, their lead isn't insurmountable, right? Right now, the Panthers are four points behind. The Leafs are seven points behind, which seven points is not. Well, pull up the, you have the table there? Or you, or you, do you have it on the screen? pull it up right now, actually. Yeah, That's pull it up for those watching on YouTube. This is the video elements, if you're if you're only listening on podcasts, you know, watching on YouTube gives you that little extra video element as we we share the screen right now of the uh, the division rankings and, and the standings board. And, and there it is. Boston leading the way, 13-1-3 on the year with 29 points. Toronto, seven points back, 10-5-2. Like, here's the thing. It's going to take a lot, right? Like, the Leafs have to go on a run. And the thing is, the Leafs haven't really gone on a run yet, like right. Boston did at the start of the year. I mean, I mean, the Leafs are truly capable of doing that. The one thing, too, is the Leafs still have three games left against Boston this season. Those are the opportunities right there. If you want to find any chance of climbing back into the Atlantic Division, you have to take advantage of those opportunities there. And I know some people, you know, some said maybe the Leafs' path shouldn't go through the Atlantic and they should find a different way in the playoffs. I think if you go ahead and if you, you know, win the Atlantic, you make your life so much easier for yourself because you're you're giving yourself every significant advantage. So, yeah, I, I would like to see the Leafs push Boston for that spot. Whether I see Boston taking a step back, I mean, a point eight five three save uh, points percentage, not really sustainable. At no. some point, you expect Boston to think to even out a little bit. It's well, just when Boston evens out a little bit, or if they go on a little bit of a stretch, can the Leafs capitalize? That's the real right. big thing there. You have to, you have to capitalize at the right time. Well, and and look, we, we said the same thing last year, right? When no. Boston got off to that historic start, and we said, ah, they're they're going to stumble at some point, and the stumble never came. Now, obviously, they had a guy by the name of Patrice Bergeron on their team last year, and David Krejci, who are both no longer with the club. But they still seem to be just chugging along. Like, like just look at that, right? Their, their record. They've won regulation loss through 17 games to start the season. They've yet to lose in regulation on home ice, which, again, was very similar to last year where I, I think they only lost like three or four games in regulation on home ice. It was, it was incredible. 
um, and, and a league leading plus 23 goal differential. So they're getting elite goaltending. They are stopping pucks. They're getting great defending. I mean, they have a good blue line anyways with McAvoy and, and Hampus Lindholm. Um, and they've got some other, you know, pretty solid uh, young pieces as well. But they're scoring. Like David Posternak, up until I believe uh, Quinn Hughes, I think, has overtaken him. But at the end of the Boston game tonight, Posternak was tied or was leading the league in points. So it doesn't even matter for Pasta. He's still just going out there and putting up uh, points all the time. So, you know, I don't know. The, the Boston Bruins just continue to defy the odds and, and go out there and, and win games. But uh, to your point, it's not an insurmountable lead for Toronto to go yeah. out and do. Like Boston loses two games, Toronto wins two games, and all of a sudden this is now down to three points, right? Like it's it's very easy. There's so much time left for – um, for you know these standings to to flip flop realistically, I don't think it's it's locked in by any means. If you're the Bruins, uh, so I think Toronto still definitely has a shot to do so. Um, a big one here too, if I I might add to is um, as you mentioned also, Florida's not out of it either. Like it's not in either. Florida's, Florida's yeah, Florida's still in it. Toronto's home record has not been great. That's where they got to have I think the biggest change. They're like Which they're. They they should, right? Like you, you Boston has, as you mentioned, Boston has not lost a game in regulation at home, right? The Leafs have a good road record. Mm-hmm. That's been established, but they got to find a way to be better at home. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They do. Um, through 17 games, Dave, through 17 games, 10, five and two, 22 points, but they're finally winning some games and playing some, Pretty solid hockey. They're they're getting secondary scoring now at the very least. They've won four in a row here. Um, have they finally found the right mix up front, do you think? Like the first few weeks, it took Sheldon Keefe uh, a little while. It seemed like every game or every other period, we were seeing the blender getting taken out. The last few games, it seems like things have kind of settled in here. Have they finally found the right mix, lines one through four up front? I think uh... – Lines one through three, I would say so. Line four is still the one where it, it, I don't know if that's going to be enough, right? Like, no, Gregor's shown that he can pr- chip in offensively. I think Camp has underwhelmed in a lot of ways, right? Considering now he is strictly in that fourth line role. Um, obviously, when you have Ryan Reeves in there, that doesn't help the situation, right? No, so, no, I think man's been there the last couple of games, yeah. and, you know, it's he's been better. It's definitely been better with with a capable player there, right? I think McMahon has like two points in three games, so they're Can chipping in offensively. Ryan Ryan Reeves is incapable. Is that is that what you're saying, Dave? Is that what you're saying? I think he might. He it's it hasn't really gone too well for him in that situation. I do I do like this mix because every line has a has a clear strength, right? And the funny thing is is the one line that hasn't really been producing as much, like they're they're still getting points, but they haven't broken through as in my in my opinion is the top that top line. Like yeah. when Matthew Nice was put there initially, boom, instant, it was working. Last few games, it's, it's felt like a bit of a lull with yeah. that line. Matt, like Nice scored in the last game. Maybe hopefully that does kick start something, but I do like that if that top line's not going, now you got the second and third line. Producing, not chipping in, producing. That's right. And 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 look, that was kind of the the thought process for Brad Trilliving this summer when he went out and he signed Tyler Bertuzzi and he signed Max Domi. You know, he thought to himself, you know, on nights where Matthews and Marner aren't dancing, uh, they there wasn't enough offense to to supplement the their their struggles. And that's that hasn't been the case over the course of the last couple of weeks here, right? You've got Willie and and Tavares and Bertuzzi, you know, operating at an elite elite rate, and then you've seen this third line start to really start producing some offense with Max Domi, Jurgen Kroc, and since Nick Robertson's come into the fold, and he's got what four points in six games, and Yarmy's got a couple of goals. Max Domi's racking up assists left, right, and center, so they're starting to get points from that middle six, which, to your point, is is not only good, but also it's been absolutely necessary with that top line, not quite producing at the rate that we expect them to like, 
weirdly enough, there's there's like a seven point buffer between William Nylander and the next best Leaf in terms of points so Actually, far. Six yeah. now. Pardon? Because Matthews has twenty one, Nylander has twenty seven. Well, sorry, six point buffer. Yeah, six point buffer between Nylander and, and Austin Matthews for first and second in team scoring. If I would have told you that was going to be the case come American Thanksgiving, that Nylander would have a six point lead on the next guy. Uh, on the Leafs, like you would have thought that I was crazy. What would have been more crazy is that William Nylander would have more shots on goal than Austin Matthews to this point. That also, which is another pretty wild, wild statistic. So um, I, I'm going to go back to the original question, like have they found the right mix up front? Uh, I, I think that they're on the right track for yeah. sure. Um, you know, the, Tyler Bertuzzi has seemed to found a good role on that second line. He, Tavares, and Nylander have really found some chemistry of late. Um, you know, what, what they were able to do in that game against Detroit uh, in that third period was just pure domination. Um, they were the best line, I would say, in, in, against Minnesota. It's not that they the, the team didn't play terrific, but that line was the most dangerous of all of them. And even back, you go back to Vancouver, um, same thing. William Nylander, super dangerous, along with Tavares and uh, against Calgary as well. Um, so, you know, it's it's been a, a few games here where those guys really started to pick up some confidence playing as a line. And again, you know, third line, top line needs to get going a little bit, but I think that they've, they've stumbled on a, a couple of right fits here. Uh, hopefully they can keep it going. Uh, in terms of the blue line and the goaltending, we'll talk about where we're at with those situations when we come back. But before... Uh, we do have those discussions. I do want to tell you about one of today's show sponsors, and it's our good friends over at Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from receipt, and their best price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Uh, Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you a complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view for your receipt before you buy it so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. And all in prices show your total upfront so you know you're getting a great deal without hidden fees. You can buy your tickets in seconds with just two taps. They're obsessed with finding you ways to help you save money on tickets too. Find exclusive flash deals and sponsored deals on tickets for football, hockey, basketball, concerts, you name it. And with zone deals, you pick the section and game time picks the seats for an average of an 18% savings. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Down the game time at create an account and use the code locked on NHL for $20 off your first purchase. Turns apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code locked on NHL for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast. It's Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti. We want to thank all of the everydayers out there for joining us once again for today's podcast. And if you're new to the show and you've made it this long, thank you. We really appreciate uh, you giving us a shot 20 plus minutes into the pod. And if you have enjoyed it, we would ask that you would give us a little like if you're watching on uh, YouTube. Subscribe as well. That would be much, much appreciated. And let us know down below. I want to hear in the comment section your thoughts on how the Leafs are doing just 17 games into the season as we've reached the American Thanksgiving mark. Um, so we talked a lot about the offense and how the offense is starting to come around. Is the goaltending starting to come around, Dave? Oh, for Elias Hamsonov, I think is starting to. I think Joseph Wolf, I mean, again, we we said that he wasn't going to be at at that like 960 or 950 save percentage that he was when he when he came in. I think Samsonov's improving. Just like it's kind of leveling it out where like one hasn't truly ran away with the job, right? I think there this the timeshare has kind of gone back to what it we kind of expected it to be. You know, I I, I do think that it's the one position that I think. I'm I'm not like concerned about it, but I'm also not totally ready to say that it's you know fait complete, right? There's no issues whatsoever. Like they've had some struggles, they've had some games where I feel like you need a you need a save here or there, but um it also it's hard to truly evaluate the goaltending with the way the blue line has played in front of them. 
That is true. That is true. Um, uh, yes, there's definitely needs to be some improvements to the blue line. And look, the rumors are running rampant again with the Leafs not in action until Friday, like basically a full week off. Um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of people talking about potentially making a trade. Uh, you know, the, the the name that keeps getting brought up is Nikita Zadorov and, and Chris Tanner potentially, which would improve this blue line, I do believe. We'll see if anything comes comes of it. But uh, when I look at the goaltending, though, and, and, and you said Ilya Samsonov, you believe he might be starting to round into form. You look at his last four starts here, and, and you are starting to see, you know, the Sammy of last year. He, he, I mean, the, the Tampa game, both Tampa games, I guess you could say, those have been brutal. Like, th- those are just yeah. terrible. Those are terrible. terrible at, at Busters. Yeah, like, y- y- you take those out, and his three games – Outside of that, so his last start against Detroit uh, allowed a couple goals, you know, quick and early in the first half of the game, but then shut things down. Had a 931 save percentage in that game over in Sweden. And then in the game against Vancouver before heading over to Sweden, stopped 31 of 33 for a 939 save percentage. And that's a good Vancouver team, a really good Vancouver team who's, you know, up in the top of the league in terms of goals per game, limited to just two goals. And then Boston, prior to that Tampa game, um, limited to them to two goals through 65 minutes of play. Had to go all the way into a shootout before they were able to to get another goal past Samsonov. So three of his last four starts, he's only allowed two goals, and he's got a save percentage of 931 or greater. So it does seem like he's starting to turn things around, which is really good to see. And the Maple Leafs are going to need that out of Ilya Samsonov. Like, clearly what was happening prior to that, you know, him turning it around, that skid where this team was allowing five-plus goals every single game was not sustainable. It was not a winning formula. They were quite literally losing games. Um, but now they shrink that down to two or three goals, and there's more than enough offense on this team to, to win a lot of hockey games. So uh, it's it's good to see, obviously, Sammy starting to turn some things around. But to your point, I still want to see some better defensive play uh, to really, really buy in and say, okay, this team's back to being the way that they need to be to be a competitive and cup contending hockey team. Yeah, I, I do think that when you when you look at how teams have been able to win the cup lately, right? I look at the Colorado, I look at Vegas. They don't need the superstar goaltending performances like a Vasilevsky or Bobrovsky, even when Carey Price somehow got the Habs team to the cup final. Teams can rely on that. I don't think it's sustainable as much. We're just seeing Andre Vasilevsky pretty much having to get his back prepared for carrying that Tampa team. I, I look at what those teams have done with goaltenders like Hill, Grubauer. You can find ways to win with goaltending that's not... They, they have to be good, right? You can't go in with the Nazi Niami in that. We right? wow. have... Well, <laughs> unless you have Duncan Keith and Brent Seabrook. Championship? Like, his, didn't Niami win their first championship? He, not not the, was it the first one? Or, yeah, because then Corey Crawford came in after the fact. Yeah. But that that was not a goaltending masterpiece. Um, Michael Layton was on the other side. That's not yeah. going to happen too often. I was going to say, you're not going to, you're not going to have the, the, yeah, the situation you're going up against a Michael Layton on the other side. Good point, so, Stan. Yeah, I, I think... I think the goaltending is the least of this team's concern because I do think, like, look, we've seen Joseph Wolf come in, have really good performances. We've seen Sammy come in, have really good performances. I think they can be locked in when the time comes. It's all about this blue line. And I think it's going to continue to be all about this blue line for the next few months until they make that one, that move that we're all kind of anticipating. Yeah, and again, well, hopefully that move does come rather rather quickly. Um, because I, 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 you just want, you just want to have kind of breathe a sigh of relief. Like, okay, this team's good. They're back to, to, you know, being where they're at. And there is the thought, you know, once they get back from Sweden, things would ramp up with the Zadorov slash Chris Tanev trade possibility. And, and maybe that means that either Klingberg is going the other way, or maybe Klingberg, you know, ends up on a stint on Robida Island, ah, whatever ends up happening there. 
Um, but, you know, Connor Timmons also is close. Like, he joined the team in Sweden. He was practicing, wasn't cleared to play a game. But if he was out there and was, like, possible to play in Sweden, I, I think that he will probably play this weekend. We got Chicago on Friday. Is, is that what it is, a Chicago game on Friday? Yeah, Chicago on yeah. Friday. I would think that Timmons will be good to go. Like, they're not skating today. They're, it's a It's a scheduled off day. So we won't know if he's going to be, you know, one of the top six uh, in, in practice because there won't be one. But I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Connor Timmons back in the fold. And, you know, who knows what Connor Timmons could do? He was, dude, looking like Kale Timmons in the preseason. Uh, before I, I pulled the trigger on a trade, I do think I would like to see a couple of games from Connor Timmons here just, just to see what it looks like. Yeah, and – you're going to have a pretty good opportunity here because they do have a back-to-back. It's funny. You have all this time off throwing them in the back-to-back. And it's actually a pretty... Like, if you want to test and see what you have, this upcoming stretch is in the bag. You've got the Blackhawks, the Penguins, the Panthers, the Kraken, the Bruins, the Senators. Some good teams. Some pretty decent teams. So if you really... As you said, like if you want to give Connor Timmons that look that you think he, he needs to really show what he can do, Again, it's a little, a little hard to say. Yeah, in these like five games, you need to show that you're actually a capable NHL defenseman for us. But these are where the opportunities come, right? You want Connor Timmons wondering how he's going to get into the lineup. Take a job from someone. Take a job from John Klingberg, right? Show the Leafs that, yeah, you can either rope it out, island this guy, or you can try to ship him out of town because I can do what he can do. And for a lot cheaper. Yes, uh, a lot cheaper. Uh, a lot, lot cheaper. Uh, just really quickly, defensively, just going to see where the Leafs rank. Uh, currently 17 games into the regular season. At their th- American Thanksgiving point, they sit 11th worst, which I guess I should probably do it the other way, uh, which ranks them 22nd in expected goals against at 5-on-5. Five five. But I would imagine we go to all strengths because they've had a t- terrible uh penalty kill they probably sit in the bottom 10 in terms of goals against um you know this season so far uh just double checking the the math there actually no 19 could have sworn that they oh no i checked did something else hold on i feel like they've gotten a bit better lately on the bad so goals against 22 so they're 22nd uh, in terms of goals against per 60, uh, in terms of expected goals per 60, that's where they were 19. Okay, so in, in expected goals, they're a little bit better. Uh, but the real issue what they've had a lot this season, I think, is the amount of uh, high scoring chances that they've given up. Uh, yeah. They also sit in 11. But this is, we're starting to see these numbers kind of tail off, though. In the last little bit, I will say that because early on, the Leafs were leading in a lot of these categories, and now you're seeing over the last you know four or five games, they're starting to fall back closer to the middle of the pack, and you know they're giving up less than 30 scoring chances a game now. Like I remember when when we took a look at this a couple of weeks ago when they were really in their funk when they were at home giving up five, five spot every single night. They're the chances, the high danger chances, the goals that they were allowing were all like bottom five of the league. It was brutal. And now they're, you know, falling outside the top 10. So that's that's good to see out uh, of the bottom 10, I suppose. So, you know, improvement from the blue line at the very least. It's, it's good to see, I guess, is, is, uh, is, is how we can say that. All right, really quickly, uh, quarter season MVP, Dave. Oh, it's well, it's well. Will Nye, the wrist shot, Bill Nye, the I'm a stud guy. Like, William Nylander has by far, there's no one else on this team that's deserving of the attention that he's getting right now. No. Bill Nye, the, the, the stud guy? I don't guy? know. Where, what? Is that what did you say Bill Nye, the stud guy? Is that what yeah. we're going with now? Yeah. It's a stud. Okay. All right. All right. All right. The stud guy. All right, we'll roll with it. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, it's quarter season MVP. Um, most disappointing Leaf, who you think needs to bounce back and will bounce back? Most disappointing, David Camp. Mm. Yes, uh, you know they tried him at third line center, didn't work. Okay, 
Mia Culpa on that one. Sheldon Keefe. Fourth line center now. I don't like that he's below 50% on the faceoff dot. He's got to get better at that, right? He's not. He's a guy that needs to have the puck on his stick, right? Possession. He's he well, lo- right? stick, uh, his, his team needs to get the puck yeah, back. Right? Like, the reason why the penalty kill wasn't so good, I, I'd like to know what his his faceoff percentage was on the penalty kill. I can tell you that in two seconds. Keep talking. Because that's an area where I feel like if you're wanting to figure out why the Leafs penalty kill hasn't been so good, I guarantee you look at this at the faceoff percentage. And there's a reason why you started to see John Tavares once in a while taking draws on the penalty kill because he's the, the best faceoff guy on this team right now. Which I think if you ask people last year or two years ago, they wouldn't have put John Tavares as the best one. He's he yeah. he has always been good at it. And it's not like all of a sudden John Tavares is good at faceoffs. But he is by far and away the least best at taking draws. Yeah, I mean he's always been pretty good at that though. So I, yeah. I don't know if I would um, necessarily say he hasn't been. Uh, where are we at here for ooh, so face off percentage? Well, that's just that's not that can't be real. <laughs> I don't like when Mike says that. Well, I can't well it's weird because for uh, John Tavares, it says face off percentage is like fourteen thousand percent. Well, that's definitely not sense. definitely that's, not right. I'm really confused by by this number. It's telling me fourteen thousand percent for John Tavares. Uh, face offs one per six. Well, I okay. What is going on here? This is on the penalty kill, correct? Penalty kill. Penalty kill, yeah. Hang on, let me let me double check this number here. This this doesn't seem this doesn't seem right. What I'm what I'm seeing right now. Okay. What's telling me is oh, I'm on rates, not count. here. I think I got it. He is forty eight point three nine percent. I was looking at rates. Yeah, I was looking at rates, not counts. John Tavares is okay. <laughs> one for one in face offs at uh, on the penalty kill. Yeah, David Kent, 48.39, uh, sub 500. Um, the only one who's above 500 is Austin Matthews, and that's barely. He's he's not, yeah, he's not, and he's not taking as many faceoffs as David Camp. Yeah, he's two faceoff losses away from being 500. So, uh, yeah, we got David Camp, who's taken over 60 draws uh, on the PK, and he is less than 50%, which means 50% of the time you're losing possession. And you're allowing the offensive uh, or the opposition to maintain possession and to establish it in the offensive end up by it with an extra person on the ice. Yeah, it's not going to turn out very well for you. Um, curious what it was last year. Now that you brought that up, I, I, I'm, I'm going to quickly go and see Ooh. what that number was up last year to see exactly like if if our if our hunch is correct, where he has lost out. Um, let's see. Last year, shorthanded. Interesting. He's actually worse. Worse last year. He was forty percent. Forty percent last year, apparently, in uh, in faceoffs. Last season. Like uh, that, I I find that very curious. That also the reason why I'm this is making me really shake my head is. Manny Malhotra is one of your coaches, one of the best face-off guys at his time when he was in the league. Yeah. So. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. But I mean, the least penalty kill also was not great last year. That's like I still like. I think that's something that hasn't really improved in the way that, and I don't. I didn't expect it to really improve because they didn't really make moves to m- improve it, right? The only thing they did was saying, hey, we're going to put Austin Matthews now because we can't really defend the penalty kill, so we're just going to try to play offense on the penalty kill, which a lot of teams are doing right now. It's like the Bruins kind of started when they put Marshawn on the penalty kill. Get that offensive guy out there. So the Leafs are going with that method. And, yeah, I I still think David Camp, though, if I'm giving that guy that hasn't worked out. Yeah, one hundred percent. Because I mean, we're just we're, the contract they signed him to. 
Well, yes, there's also that. There should be higher expectations on him now making, you know, an extra million than he was making a, a season ago. But, like, you know, we were just referring to his, uh, you know, the situation that he was in on the PK, right? Like, hoping that he can win some more draws on the PK. But just overall, his numbers have slipped. You know, like, he's, he's sub 50%, which is not David Camp-esque, right? So this year, he's 48%. In all situations, uh, in uh, in the faceoff circle, where last year was fifty one and a half percent, the year fifty two percent. Like this is the worst. Uh, he ha- he's only been under fifty percent once in his career, and that was his second uh, season in the NHL. Since then, he's rattled off four terrific faceoff seasons uh, of above fifty one and a half percent. This year. 48 percent so that's it's quite a significant drop off uh and, and one that certainly he needs to turn around if this fourth line wants to you know keep pucks out of the back of the net but i i again something that i think is a lot better than it was earlier in the season because earlier i believe when we looked at this stat it was like 41 percent or something like that which was yeah. abysmal so we're seeing we're seeing you know an uptick there as well for david camp which is really nice to see uh, all right. Um, anything else that uh, you want to acknowledge through the first 17 games of the season to the to this point at, at American Thanksgiving about the, the Maple Leafs? Well, I'm just wondering, are you surprised? What's your what's been your biggest surprise? Uh, well, Willie, I, I mean, sure. I knew that Nylander was a good player, a great player. I didn't know that he was a superstar. And that's what he's kind of turned into early this season. Like coming into yesterday, he was second in the NHL, one point shy of the NHL lead in points. And he's on a five game goal streak right now. Like the guy's doing it all. He's, he's, you know, putting passes on the tape of Tyler Bertuzzi for easy tapping goals. Like he's, he's putting up primary points left, right, and center. He's not even leading the team in ice time. No. Like all the superstar not. players are like, you think. He get like yeah, he's still getting a decent yeah. The Sheldon keeps not shafting him with ice time, but you you would think that with the way he's performing, he is well and above getting what he's usually getting, and it's not the case. No, no, it's not. Um, yeah, he's been he's been phenomenal. I'm curious actually who leads. He's got to be up there in terms of league lead for like points per sixty at this point. Then no, got to be up there. I would, I would have to think so. I'm gonna double check those numbers. Let's make sure it's not at five on five, though. Uh, my computer's not, not, not doing well right now, so maybe I won't be able to check that number. But uh, okay, there we go. Like, what's going on? Like when, when we look at the players who like lead, always lead the league in points or things like that, they're usually playing. The most out of anyone on their team, and I think that's the one for me with with Willie is he's doing it without getting, you know, the prime chances all the time. Yeah, he's getting I, as I, as we know he's getting his his chances, but you look at the guys he's chasing, like a David Bostonak. He is certainly not playing more than David Bostonak this year, and he's yeah. right right there with him. Right, absolutely, he is. Uh- uh, I don't know why I can't find the, the number. All strengths, points per 60. I was scrolling, and I saw Marner ahead, and I didn't even get to Willie. That, that makes absolutely zero sense, if that's the case. Hang on. Let me see if I could. If, ah, there we go. Okay, sixth in the NHL. Uh, fourth in the NHL because Zach Fan- Sanford's number one. He's played one game, and Yoel Kivaranta is third. He's played four games for forty-one total minutes. Um, so we'll call it fourth in the NHL in points per sixty, four point eight three points per sixty, trailing only Jack Hughes, Pasternak, and Artemi Panarin. So yeah, he's been one of the most dominant weapons offensively um, in the NHL. Like that's that's been the surprise, I guess you could say. Uh, again, knew he was good, knew he was great, didn't know he was a superstar, and that's what he's shown so far. And that's going to be costly for the Maple Leafs 
this summer. But maybe that's a conversation that we can have again tomorrow. What may a Nylander contract look like? But we'll have lots of time for it. <laughs> we'll have lots of time again. Leafs off, uh, off practice tomorrow, so you know, no practice updates, and they also don't play again until Friday either. So yes, we've got uh, we've got time. Maybe tomorrow we can also break down the rest of the division and take a peek at what's going on around the Atlantic. So do all of that on tomorrow's show, but that'll do it for us here on today's podcast. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked On Leafs podcast on all podcast platforms and receive daily Leafs content. Follow myself on X at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore more suiting. Follow the show as well at Locked On Leafs. Uh, go ahead, leave a like if you're watching on YouTube. Leave a comment down below as well. Your impressions of the Leafs uh, at the American Thanksgiving mark. Uh, we'll be back with another episode for y'all tomorrow. But until then, keep it locked right here on Locked On Leafs.